Uh, Professor Sandita Wright, describe yourself and a little bit of your family, education, and work background. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I grew up in India, and I was born in India, and I grew up in India, and I lived all over India because my father worked for, you know, the sort of the Reserve Bank, which is like the Federal Reserve Bank here, and so we traveled quite a bit. But I'm originally from the east of east of India, which is from the state of West Bengal, um, but I grew up in Mumbai, what they call Mumbai now, what we used to call Bombay. And, uh, and then we traveled all around India, depending on where my father was posted. And then we ended up in Mauritius, in the island of Mauritius. Um, and my father died quite young. And, um, you know, like uh, most uh, South Asians, uh, or most Asians, you know, you're fair, you know there's a lot of pressure to uh, be, you know, a lawyer or an engineer. And then in, in India, when I was growing up, um, if you were very, very smart, and the idea was, and you, you got tracked early on, so, uh, I was tracked into the science, even though I was very good in, in lit. Um, but my father always wanted to me to be like somebody who did literature. So, um, so it was after he died. I had actually got into sort of the medical school in India when my father died. Then we came out to Kolkata, and I needed a year's break just to my mother and I and my, my brother. There were just three of us to kind of you know settle in. And so then I was like, what am I going to do for one year while I wait? I joined the local college in Calcutta and, and, and became an English major and then never, and then never looked back. And then I was like, I'm not going to go to med school. I just love this. <laughs> and then I, I studied there and then I came here uh, in about 1985 and I got a master's in, uh, I don't know if you've heard of this place, called Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, which was like a real culture shock for me because it was like a small town and I'd never been in small towns in my life. And I was like, this is America? Like, it is like one street, you know, four buildings. Um, and then I went to the University of Washington in Seattle uh, for my PhD. So I went from, so I came to Ohio for two years, and then I went to Washington. And, um, and then I got this job, and after I finished my PhD. Um, and I've been here since 1991 um, teaching. So I wrote, I came here, when I came here to do my master's and PhD, I thought I was going to be, uh, studying Victorian literature, so 19th century British, because that made the most sense because, you know, India was a British colony for so long, which is why we grew up speaking English. So I mean, English is my mother, is like almost my mother tongue. And um, so we, I came here and I was like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and Lick Dickens, Thomas Hardy. And in the process of, um, uh, you know, sort of, I came with a very good background in English lit, unlike a lot of people who get their education here. Um, so I knew all British, all of British lit pretty much. And so I, so when I came here, I was exposed to some American lit because of course in India in those days, people thought Americans, you know, whatever, what is American lit? What they call American lit, right? They just such a new country. And so then I, um, uh, I, I, I was introduced to what you would call like uh, in, the, in the 90s, in the late 80s, early 90s, something called high theory. And through that high theory, I got to learn something called post-colonial theory. And I was really fascinated by that, sort of the, sort of the whole idea of the British Empire, its, its influence on the colonies, the why, you know, the, the history of oppression, national independence, Indian literature. And so I ended up writing a dissertation that was comparative. So it was partly on Bengali literature, partly on Victorian literature, and partly on Indian literature in English. Um, and the field that I'm in, was then just like starting out. It was a big field. It was like a, you know, it was the right moment at the right at the right time at the right moment. So I got it, I got this job. I was married, and my partner was also an academic, and so he was teaching in Florida, also an English major, also an English PhD. Uh, and then so we were looking for places on the same coast so we could just commute. So he was in University of Florida. I was here, and um, so that was, so I you know that was I teach so I teach um, literatures from South Asia, the Africa. And the Caribbean, so that's kind of my background. And I wrote, I've written, book, you know, a few books, a lot of articles, I edited an anthology. I just recently edited a three-volume, came out in 2017, three-volume uh, encyclopedia of postcolonial studies. My last book I just finished writing uh, is coming out hopefully at the end of this year or maybe early next year. Um, so that's kind of my background. Uh, I grew up quite sort of, I come from quite a privileged background, so so, so coming here um, and becoming like, uh, being perceived as a, 
as an Indian woman. Or I mean, I remember thinking about, oh, I never thought of myself as an Indian woman when I was in India. <laughs> I was like a Bengali woman. I was just a, I was an Indian. And when I came here, I was like South Asian. And then I was also, as things progressed, I also became a woman of color. And then I'm somehow now Asian American, though mm -hmm. I'm not. I, I, I mean, I guess I would be an Asian American, but that's. I still think of myself as a South Asian who teaches the post colonial life. Describe your relationship to the founding and growth of the Asian American Studies program at the University of Maryland. Be as specific with dates, names, and other details as possible. When I came here, um, we didn't have somebody in the English department that taught Asian American lit. We had a person who was, either she was a lecturer or some administrator, uh, Bonnie something. And in my third, fourth year uh, as, as a professor here, we, we got together and decided to, she was wanted to do this course. Uh, there had never been a course on Asian American studies. I taught myself Asian American literature because I was like, that's interesting, through the South Asian. And, and at that point when I was teaching, South Asian writers were not considered to be like South Asian American because Asian American was, is, is still is profoundly dominated by Southeast Asians and East Asians, right? So Filipino American, Vietnamese American, Korean American, um, Chinese American, you know, the most dominant. The 1960s, post the 60s sort of migration of South Asians were were just South Asians, you know, so they and they were all engineers and doctors, so they were not writing so literature. So there were very few sort of, there were still writers writing in English, but they were always considered Asian. But then every now and then I would throw in a book. And so when Bonnie decided to do this Asian American Studies class, um, I was like, oh, that sounds really interesting. And then Bonnie left. She, she was going to do the course, and then she moved. She left somewhere. And suddenly somebody had to teach this class. And there was nobody to teach this class but me. There was this guy, um, but he was very instrumental, and I forget which department he was. It may have been in government, uh, or school of public policy, or I forget his name. Will, Will something, his name was. Phil will know the name. And so Will and Bonnie were the ones who were going to teach this class. And so then, when it didn't happen, and they needed a, a professor, I mean, I kind of stepped in, and I taught myself basically the syllabus, you know. So that's how I learned about Ronald Takaki and these books called Strangers from a Different Shore. And this was probably, I want to say, <coughs> I want to say before I got tenure. So it must have been 1994, 1993, 1994 that I taught this class. And it was a big learning curve for me. Like I had to learn while I was teaching. <coughs> we had this, I had this wonderful, in that class there was this wonderful student, Angela. She was a Filipino American, and she was one of the brightest students. She was like a freshman, very gung ho for Asian American sisters. And there were two sisters. One started a little later, and they were, the ve were very, very instrumental in getting Asian American studies off the off the ground. She was in my class, and she ended up doing what's called an independent studies <coughs> major with me in the end. And she taught me a lot. Um, so we taught that class. And then at that same time, around that same time, we hired Professor Candice Chu, who was a junior professor. She came here and we hired her as an Asian Americanist. So, so th there was a lot of a concatenation of circumstances. There was the course that was taught, there was a tremendous uh, surge of interest from students who lobbied really hard. They had a sit-in at the chancellor's office. Um, they rallied the forces. They did, I would say that the Asian American Studies certificate program exists here, not because of the professors, but because, because there wasn't a mass of professors, but it was the students. So they drove, they were the, I think, you know. So in a way, the founding of Asian American Studies here is a kind of reminder of how ethnic studies began in the 60s post-Civil War, but, so, you know, you know the sort of anti-Vietnam, that what was happening with ethnic studies in Berkeley, in California. We saw a similar kind of in a small scale here with these wonderful students. Um, so that was one part of it. And then the university decided to have a committee uh, to try to see what we could do. 
paint a picture for us of what it was like to be on campus at the time. What are some of the vivid memories you have that can help us to understand life in College Park around the year 2000? Well, so when all of this was going on, the, the then dean of the two colleges, behavior, I think it was the behavior resource and our who, and then there was the provost, they were all sort of, you know, we have to do something to address this. But, you know, the Asian American studies has been primarily either uh, from resource, behavioral and social sciences and the humanities oriented, right? It's never involved scientists. But uh, we, at that point in time, the University of Maryland had a big sort of China program that had just started going, sort of, with, sort of coming together. This was a lot, this was earlier before 2000, right? Because I still hadn't gotten tenure. I got tenure in 96, and 97. And the, for some reason, uh, the administration, for some reason, whatever the reasons they ever wanted to do, they chose the guy who was the director of the Chinese studies program to be the chair of the committee. And there were a couple of scientists. There was a physicist, Bob, whose name I can't remember, and there was an entomologist, Michael Ma, or him I remember. And they wanted a, an involvement with this group, but they had did not have a clue as to what Asian American studies was. We are, we, if, if we are going to let you have an Asian American studies program, we want an input. But we don't really understand what it is that you do, but we want an input. And their rhetoric was kind of racist because they would say things like, we, are, we don't want to reproduce what African American studies does. We don't want something called victim studies, is what they would say. You know, like, we're not minor, we don't want minority studies. And I was like, uh, do you know anything about Asian American studies? So they had, they really wanted to have a component for the, certif for the certificate that you take, to like have courses in science. And so can you bring that, but they had no idea of that discourse. So anyway, so that was all going on and we had meetings and there was a lot of, it was not easy, let's put it that way. Um, we had uh, some key players, one was Sung, uh, Professor Sun Kyung Kim, who went off just about a couple of years ago to Indiana. Uh, Han, who was a director for, of the Asian American Science Certificate for a while. Uh, so we had her and we had me and we had Candace in the background and we just like, what are you talking about, right? So we held a, a kind of a little mini conference. We did two of them, I think one, and we had Gary Okihiro who came, to, who was at Cornell at the time. And we had, oh, and yes, and we had another a wonderful person called Gina Marchetti who was then in the media studies program, then became part of Complet, and she worked um, on Asian American studies slash, slash Asia. She had written a fantastic book called The Yellow Peril, looking at cinema. So we had some wonderful people, but we were not being listened to. So we had this sort of meeting, we had this sort of forum, and Gary Okihiro came, and Gina was marketed to give a talk, and we had Lisa Lowe and David Palamulu, there was another conference. We liked a series of events to get people to come in to t sort of educate the audience about what Asian American studies was. But anyway, we couldn't get the certificate off the ground till we uh, involved them. So we actually ended up creating a program and telling them come up with some course descriptions. And they did, and they were never taught. Addressing future generations of Asian American studies students, summarize in just a minute your dreams for that and any lessons learned since your days affiliated with AASD? I think the future of Asian American Studies on this campus depends on Asian American Studies students. Uh, I think students who have, have, a, have a voice um, in the university, I think students can get uh, the president and the provost to listen to them. And I feel like, especially nowadays, since the humanities are under attack and everything has become about uh, skill sets, like whether you're a computer science major or an engineering major, the art of thinking uh, creatively and philosophically is at, under peril. And I think that trying to keep Asian American studies alive uh, is a, is a, is a, would create a space where students from uh, different backgrounds could come together to think about themselves not just as Asian Americans, but to think about what you want to offer the world beyond just the kinds of work that you might choose in your career. Like, where are you a political person? You know, do you believe, do you have a certain kind of politics? How would you like to change the world, you know? 
maybe not one sound bite at a time, but maybe something bigger. And I think we are in somewhat of a danger in maybe losing um, the, 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 all that we have built so far. And in order to keep going, for it to become functional, I would urge the students to really, really push the university to hire somebody central in the field of Asian American studies, housed in arts and humanities. Um, somebody trained in Asian American studies who can be a good leader for the certificate program. Thanks.